you're listening to the Board Game Snobs podcast, a ridiculous podcast with ridiculous hosts that discuss ridiculous things. And any mention of board games is purely coincidental. And so, without further ado, and with a heavy dollop of shame and embarrassment on my part, I give you the Board Game Snobs. <laughs> Catch me off guard there. I'm drinking some of this boxed wine. It's good. It's is good wine. I mean, it's well, as not, good as boxed wine it, can be. When I say good, obviously there's some sommelier out there freaking out. But I mean for boxed wine. It doesn't taste bad. That's my requirement. It it pairs well with depression <laughs> and staying home from work. <laughs> and, and lack of funds. Yeah, it's a QVC channel. Just like uh, bourbon. I mean, uh, no. I get the benchmark that pairs well with my bank account. I like bourbon, though. I got it. I told you that Wolcott is my my new. I don't know that you've told me on the podcast, but you've told me in IRL. IRL. That's good stuff. Anyways, this is the Board Game Snob Podcast. This is Jerry. This is Gabby. We're Hello. Co- we're covering from our three hour long uh, call in episode, which was awesome. I think probably one of the best episodes we've ever had. It was very nice. I'm editing it. Well, never mind. It's It was a great show, yes. Yes. You are editing it now at the time that we're shooting this. Correct. But by the time this comes out, it's been played. It's been done. It's I, a done deal. Now, I have theories. Uh, about things. three-hour I, shows? No. Podcast. something I'd like to talk to you about. Okay. Okay. So, do you, you know about string theory? I've heard the term. Okay. Well, that's like the quantum verse, except for uh, uh, Ant-Man. I'm with you. Okay. You had me at Ant-Man. So string theory is a theory that attempts to merge quantum mechanics with general relativity. But essentially, when you think of this string theory, this is the same thing that people talk about when they think of uh, like time travel. Like there's different, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. everybody says string string theory, and then they start talking about time travel, how there's different multiverses. There is no string. Apparently Apparently string theory is kind of getting debunked. I think I thought that you, we, I, we probably haven't discussed that specifically, but we have brought up string theory before. And I think you said those words. I have. So anyways, let's get off this and get on to the multiverse <laughs> theory, which is the hypothesis that there are different m- multiverses. There's multiple verses and other uh, universes, which has no you don't need to know this to know what I'm about to tell you. I am getting off track. Are you ready for this theory? I am ready. Are you familiar? I know you're a movie snob with the 2002 film Reign of Fire. Correct. Starring Christian Bale. Matthew McConaughey. And Charlize Theron. And a load of dragons. Not a lot of dragons. Not the main dragon. Heart. No. Or Z. This dragon was. No, that's Dragon Ball. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to make anybody. I don't want to spoil this. But if you haven't watched Rain of Fire, go watch Rain of Fire. It flopped in the movie theaters. It's basically they're digging a subway and they wake up a dragon and it wakes up all the under earthed dragons. And apparently dragons are what killed the dinosaurs. And they come out every once in a while and they burn the earth. And Christian Bill gets mad at the dragons. No. But Matthew McConaughey is even more mad at the dragons and willing to die for. To kill the dragons. Which is the point. So here's the thing about this movie that gets me is that Christian Bell had a, like a Cockney accent and he's like, oh, no, we ought to hide. And that's not a Cockney. You know what they say. That, like, <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. Oh, we got to hide in this castle. That's not even a Cockney accent. You know what I'm talking Go about. Go say some more. They say like oh, to... the bobs and the bits. We got to take. The... You know what they do? Bits and the bobs. Bits and the bobs. There's a drag. I can. I always go Australian. Yeah. Hold on. Let me let me do focus. the Cockney. When I do call, when I think of Cockney, I always think of Liza Doolittle. Uh, mine, Ryan and Spine falls mainly on the plane. Yeah, after our salad dressing. Come on, Dover, move your bloomin'. Yes, that's him. Says. 
Whereas uh, Matthew McConaughey has his typical, he's it's this is angry McConaughey. He's works. Everybody else in this film is dressed like peasants, like medieval peasants with robes. Mm-hmm. But Matthew McConaughey shows up in a literally in a tank, wearing a vest, just a leather, sleeveless vest, a leather. They're all vests are sleeveless, and the gloves. And this my thing with yes. post apocalyptic movies: all the gloves have lost their fingers. I have fingerless gloves. Just for that case, if yeah, the grid well, ever goes down, you're ready to I'm fire some my guns and fiz- fingerless gloves. Shave your head bald with a sh- knife. I'm not going to shave my head bald, but that does help against lies. Anyways, not to spoil anything about this movie because you should all go watch it, even though it has somewhat of a cult following. But in this, rolling a fire, rolling a fire. What happens is, yeah, the trailer's awesome. Jason Stan. The trailer looks. Right in the fire, go go. Right in the fire, yeah, right fire. And it, it didn't. It didn't. It flopped because there's not that much fire in it. Either way, Christian Bale's character kills the dragon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And do you know that you have to be a knight to kill this dragon? To kill a dragon in myth, the mythos. I think that's somewhere so in my noggin. Somewhere I know this happened. Christian. Bale kills the dragon. I see what you're doing. But then you had Christopher Nolan watching this, and he goes, "That's that's my Dark Knight." And so 2005, Batman begins, and it's Christian Bale. So hold on, multiverse string theory. In my opinion, in Reign of Fire, Matthew McConaughey's character is actually the good guy. He's the guy that pushed everybody to go after an anti-hero, you might say. Yes, very much so. He has one of the best Matthew McConaughey lines in this movie. Do you know one of the lines that he has? He's trying to convince Christian Bale to let them into the fort. And he says, I've got the guns. No, he says, uh, we could do this easy. Well, we could do this real easy. <laughs> that is by far the most underappreciated line. Anyways, if it, it, here's my thing. And here's what I'd like to give to you. If Matthew McConaughey had been the one to kill the dragon in the other multiverse, here's Christopher Nolan going, that's my dark night. And that is how close we came to having Matthew McConaughey be Batman. And I want you to go on this ride with me. Just imagine it. Just imagine for the moment if Matthew McConaughey was the dark night. I swear to God. Matthew. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're about to go into it. He's just like, who is, it's like Sean Connery doing anything. He's always Sean Connery voiced. When he's in the Russia, he's Sean Connery. When he's in English, he's Sean Connery. When Matthew McConaughey could be Batman, but he's going to be a Southern Batman. He, so I looked up the top 10 Batman lines. Just imagine. This is for you to quote in Matthew McConaughey form, no doubt. Go ahead. Best I can. Swear to God, swear to me. <laughs> I got to admit that my Matthew McConaughey kind of goes over to the. Swear to God, swear to me, swear to me. I'll be standing here long where I belong between you and the people of Gotham. Why did I do Bill Clinton? I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. I get, I, I get my Southern. I get, you, this is it's hard to do Matthew because you have to kind of get your chin out. And you have to have that S through your bottom mm-hmm. teeth. You have to say, well, mm-hmm. all right, all right. And you got right. you got to find your voice and then go into it. This isn't a car. As he says that. <laughs> says, uh, uh, I'm not wearing. I can't do it like you can. All right, all I'm right. not wearing hockey pads. I'm not wearing hockey pads. <laughs> he says, uh, when I, well, I grew up in Gotham. Gotham and I turned out all right. Where's the buttonator? Bruce. Where is it? Where it, that sounds like I, swear to me, <laughs> I won't kill you, but I don't have to say. <laughs> That's like, you sounded really good just I've, then. I've been working on it. Now, I've literally practiced this for you because it upsets me that you could naturally do an impression. I can no, and you, I have to work on this. You're doing this real, you're doing a fine job. A hero could be anybody. That's I didn't know, I didn't remember these lines. Half of these lines I don't remember. What about the the not the hero we need, but the hero we well, deserve? Well, that was that was that was Gary Oldman who oh, said that. Oh, that guy. And so Batman's just riding, and you see Matthew McConaughey riding off with he'd be shirtless most of the time in Batman, mm-hmm. and he'd just be a fine nigga. He's got the jaw for it. He's got the build for it. He just doesn't have the voice. Alfred, we cannot just let the people of Gotham. They kind of read my new book. Greenlight. 
I like how you're like even doing your mouth you and chin the same to, way. You have to you're put, like doing your head. You too. have to you're bob like, your head. You're really getting into the mind of Matthew. You, you, you do a rubbing. We can get more. I think we took our shirts off. <laughs> I think we took our shirts off. Went on downtown. I think. Uh, I think that cat woman thinks she might break into my mansion while we're gone. Best lock the doors. See, that's that. It's easy to slip off into the the other southern because you you notice like Matthew McConaughey never raises his voice. He's very calm. He always keeps it calm. He always. And that's keep, what can make him even more but it's scary. His, but it's his cape. It's, it's that all right, mm-hmm. all right, all right. He has that pace that's hard to, and you have that jaws thrust down. You got the teeth, and he he does the S. He yeah, does a, I, yeah. He, he whistles that S. That, his he teeth. whistles that S, and then he does time T sometimes. A, time is a flat circle. Time. time is a flat circle. We all got time. Some of us, we all got the same twenty four hours in a day. You just got to ask yourself. Are you going to sit around in your underwear drinking box wine or are you going to go out and make the best of it? That's hard. It's hard to do a good. There's sexy McConaughey, which is him just a lot of lawbreakers around here. There's that. It's just people think his accent is sexy. He just has a very deep. It's it. And I I wonder if he's naturally that way because he's always almost whispering with that baritone. It's always never. I just don't feel the need to yell. Why would you be yelling? I don't need any more box wine. Thank you, God. Got my bladder. Did you got your bladder of wine? Pull. So in our household, once the wine gets down to a certain level, we pull the plastic bladder out of the box because the box is bulky and takes up space in the refrigerator. I've never had box wine until I came to your house. <laughs> I thought it was a thing. Well, that I didn't understand. I didn't understand why it would be in a box. Welcome to the life of a poor man. But if you want a lot of wine, I just went to like the the big chicken. Welcome. I say, I say, welcome <laughs> to went, the life. It is, of a it poor is, man. it is like a court Colonel Ball Sanders. Hard leg horn. You got like sixteen. 18 uh, herbs and spices. Uh, 1618. Uh, Matthew McConaughey. I can't do it. I, I got to give up on that one. That one's yours. No, no. You can do McConaughey. Anybody can do McConaughey. You, but you have like this natural tone, timber you pitch to your you voice. Have keep your tongue. Keep your tongue still. Keep your tongue still. Keep it to the bottom. Yeah, keep your, tongue, Damn, your jaw okay. thrust out. Keep your tongue still. Tip of your tongue kind of lift up a little bit when, the tongue, when you need that S. The S. There you go. Dragon heart. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> i tell you what about I dragons am, there. I am the last one. That's all right. We can find you another one. <laughs> Come on down and like keep it slow like we keep a barbecue. Two best Matthew McConaughey movies off the top of my head that I enjoy thoroughly. Not the two best, but two that I enjoy very, very much. Number one, I think, was part of his reconnaissance. Matthew McConaughey, as it once was said. Matthew reconnaissance. Mud. Matthew reconnaissance. <laughs> it was a saying. That would be a show. The McConaughey. If I had a, if I was Elon Musk, what I would do would make pay people to make shows that just pop into my my mind, and that right there, Matthew reconnaissance, just Matthew McConaughey being sent into places. Just but he to, would be terrible. He's too identifiable. No, he can just walk in. This is a Bucky's. We're gonna go here. To this Bucky's. We'll go check it out. Just open. He's just looking at that. He's could, just checking out newly opened just stores. Just newly opened stores. <laughs> if you open a store, you could check this box and let the Chamber of Commerce know. Do you want a McConaughey reconnaissance? Around here, you got family dollar, dollar, uh, family dollar, dollar trees are everywhere. Why? why? <laughs> Brand new. We got three opening here in town. Well, why do y'all? Why do we all got boxes everywhere? Y'all think this is really necessary? This is not. You got box wine, but the box wine comes in boxes. It seems like there's just too many boxes. I'm having a hard time not going into Bane. Uh-oh. And you'll notice that there's some voices Seven. do have, because it's that same back of your throat. Right. It's all. Just, I'll always remember Robin Williams. This dollar store <laughs> has no manager. Robin Williams said uh, how you get, was it, was it Robin Williams? I think it was Robin Williams. It was either him or who's the guy that always did the uh, church lady on SNL? Church lady? Uh, Lunch lady? Wouldn't be pretty. Not, uh, uh, isn't that special? Oh, I don't remember. Dana Carvey. Dana Carvey. Okay, but I think this was Robin Williams. He says, how you get to George Bush back in the day. This is a very dated impression. 
He said, what you do is you take John Wayne out of Pilgrim. That's good. And to get George Bush, you tighten up his bat. I bet wouldn't be prudent. Damn. <laughs> he, just said, he said, you take George. And then I was listening to one talking about. Uh, that's good. Oh, he was doing the, the Obama impression. And he, he said something repeatedly, repeatedly. You just pick this one phrase mm-hmm. and say it repeatedly. And for the life of me now, I can't remember, but it, it just, and you say, you say it real quick. We're not going to do it. Yep. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And you just practice that one thing. Yep. Over and over. That's all it is. And that's the way it is. Voice yeah. acting and impersonations, are, I, I find very fascinating because. there. Are, and one I really, really like is anybody that can do Denzel. Denzel is, well, first off, think of certain actors. You can hear their voice right now, and you would recognize a Matt Damon. Uh-huh. I couldn't possibly come up with a Matt Damon impression. Like, I don't know. There's nothing that's very distinctive. Like Denzel, it, it's the same thing. Like, I don't know how, how do you, how do you. It's like, I don't think of Denzel. <clears throat> he's like no Sean Connery, where they're like, oh, yeah, that's definitely. But when you hear the guy doing Denzel, oh, you're like, no, oh, yeah. 100%. Yes, that's Denzel. Because, and I think it's more of the, just like I said, the cadence. Cause Denzel has this thing where he always, and he, he, Denzel is always Denzel almost in all of his movies. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. just super cool. He channels whatever he wants, but he's very much just Denzel. Mm-hmm. But that cadence of, of what he said, what he says and his movements, I always like his movements, his hand gestures and just the way that he, and he always has that smile. He smiles. And I really enjoy the fact that he's moved into this Liam Neeson area of his life where he's just doing Equalizer movies where he's very old, mm-hmm. but he destroys any and everyone that come into the movie. He's, he just destroys all these bad guys with these old man. Yeah, old man. And- now, speaking of Liam Neeson, I'm glad you brought that up. Because that was another movie idea or television show idea. Anybody who's a producer, probably for the Travel Channel, you need to pay me because I've got ideas. If I'm a billionaire, here's what I'm doing. I firmly believe that Liam Neeson, now hear me out, here's another theory. Here's another one of these big time theories, movie theories. What was Liam Neeson's like gold movie that he made that made him uber popular, Oscars, everything? Schindler's List. Schindler's Lisp. <laughs> Sorry. Are you giving away your idea? No, no. Liam Neeson. What did he do in Schindler's List? He took people. Right. That was the first taken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so then they went on and was like, okay, so like this is this is obviously his thing. He shows up and is like, these people don't need to be here. I'm going to take you. Because that's what happens and taken. Mm-hmm. If you someone got taken or tooken, tooken. Took. He shows up and is like, no, come back. I'll take you back. That's what they should have did was took. The first movie should have been taken. Took. The second taken. movie took. T- taken back. The third movie. Taken back. Taken a back. Taken a back. Oh, so here's my t- television series idea. I would pay Liam Neeson to be Liam Neeson. All right. He cannot be funny. He just has to be serious the entire time. And what it is, you can, anybody in the world can apply to be taken. You just send in your thing to the travel channel and be like, I want to be taken. And at some point in time, maybe, maybe, maybe the show is just going to be a camera crew following Liam Neeson and Liam Neeson just going to randomly come take somebody. But he's not the taker. No, he, yo, he's the that, finder. But, but he's going to take you someplace. We'll find you. He's going to find you. And I will kill you. And he's going to take you someplace nice. Like he may just show up at your work and be like, Deborah. I have a very particular set of skills. We're going bowling. And he cracks me up when he tries to do his English accent. Yeah. Because you can still hear it. You still, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I will find you and I will kill you. Wouldn't it be amazing? He just show up at your work. Come with me. We're going bowling. Come with me. If you and want everything that you do is just him going to random places, taking people to random places and just doing stuff with them. This is my favorite bowling alley. <laughs> some that's, that's some people he takes to like fantastic vacations. Like we're going to Dubai. You work at and some Domino's driver. Pull over. We're going to Bora Bora. We're going to Domino's. We'll enjoy it. In Dubai. And we'll deliver pizzas there. You it's not delivery. <laughs> it's disorder. It's not delivery. It's the journals. That would be amazing. That show would people would that be the new that would be the new uh yeah. Yeah. That would be amazing. I just love his voice now that I'm like trying to He copy has it. trained Batman. Everybody he's trained. He showed uh three days uh, what was that three days show that had Russell Crowe in it that uh he trained Russell Crowe how to save his wife out of prison. Oh. 
three days left or something like that. I saw it in theaters. It was a good show. Um, like he's trained so many people. Like he just shows up. Mm. Obi Wan Kenobi. He trained oh, him. Right. He's trained Obi-Wan. everybody. Use the force. And Obi Wan. Un- unfortunately, I was also having another theory. Go ahead, Jerry. So you know, as so we talked about, all right, I'll read the email. Right. I want to read this email because you know I talked about uh, uh, Star Wars. Anytime I express something on this podcast, I need everybody to know that probably I feel like I'm 100% right. Right. I feel that in my bones. What? Here's the thing with you, I, I, I feel like, is you're used to voicing your side of things with great confidence to two people that don't do that, uh, me and Enrique. When you're faced with someone else with great confidence, you usually, you're like, oh, okay. I listen. But also, people need to understand, first off, a lot of times I know I'm wrong, but convincing Gobby that I'm right (laughs) is part of the fun. And so, yes, if you, yeah. So anyways, uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher Clayton emailed us saying, Snobs, the definition of antihero by Oxford, is a central character, a movie, a drama who lacks conventional heroic attributes. That was close. So... The discussion in the podcast centers around comic book fantasy, blah, 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 blah. Do not confuse protagonist with hero. This is a good point. The protagonist and antagonist are not necessarily the hero and the villain of the story. If the story is focused on the villain and told from their perspective, they are the protagonist and their imposing force, the hero, is the antagonist. I thought that Bane. was a, that's a that's an excellent point. From the Bane trilogy of Star Wars. Correct. Protagonist. Protagonist. Not a hero. Right. But so, the hero of his own story. But, but I like the idea of this antagonist protagonist. He he he. There yeah, you go. That's uh, good. So good. That's good. He says. Also, here's the here's here's where I take umbrage. The central theme of the original Star Wars tale is redemption. Darth Vader is redeemed in the end. It isn't Gobby's standpoint. It is a story that was told. Gobby is right in his argument. Also, here's a snippet from the screen rant. Sith can become disembodied spirits after death. But Star Wars has finally confirmed how these different Sith spirits are force ghosts. Or to force ghosts. Star, Th- Star Wars has officially confirmed Sith spirits are in no way comparable to force ghosts. Finally, Gobby was correct. Again. The stomach lining that Jerry was thinking of is tripe. Tripe is in Menudo. Anyways, Tripe. Tripe. Thanks. Doran Phoenix, a.k.a. he's in our uh, Discord. Now, Mr. Phoenix sends good emails, even from the ashes. And either way, this is the type of emails that we need. I will say this regarding my Darth Vader Star Wars rants, because you're about to get another one. Here you go. Oh, God. How did Darth Vader know that Luke was his son? Now, I'm asking this out of ignorance. I want somebody. You're not gangster. asking this, and you've like looked it up. No, no, no. You no. want me to answer? I've done, treat me. I've gotcha. done. No, I've done. This is this me. This isn't gotcha journalism. This is not gotcha journalism. Okay. This is me formulating something out of ignorance, and then let's talk about this. How did he know? How did he know? Because he just is like sensed it, right? Is that how you think? That's what I usually think. Can I ask you this then? Or did the emperor tell him? Maybe, but how did the emperor know? He emperor knew everything. He didn't know. L- about okay, the look, literally. Okay, here's the thing. We, can, you know, Google. Ruins I don't want to. I know. I could have looked this up. I thought about this all day. I know. I could have Google. I typed in how did Darth know, and the auto completes to Luke was his son. I didn't want to look it up because I wanted to think about it before I looked it up. Tell me the answer. I, I, if for me, I'm just thinking it's a force thing. If it's a force thing, which I knew you would say that. Uh-huh. Why not Leia? How did he? Uh. Know? Sister. Oh, you have a sister. But he was around Leia. He talked to Leia more than he did Luke. Because she wasn't as attuned to the Force. But they're both attuned to the Force. But not as much. It doesn't she matter. She had it, but she wasn't as I, much in, so as he you, was. So are you implying that here you... Here we go. Okay. I feel like so I'm here, a trap. No, here's, here's the thing. Here's, it's a trap. Here's the legacy. Here's, here's my thing. Okay. Darth Vader knew that Leia was his daughter. He knew it when he was around her. He sensed something. And then when they're on the Death Star... And and Palpatine, not Palpatine, but oh, Tarkin's like, execute her immediately. Here's what I think happened. I think Darth Vader let her go. I think he caused so much confusion upon the Death Star to make sure that his daughter didn't get killed. Because they they get away from the Death Star. Like, things happen that this doesn't make sense that they got off this thing and got away scot-free. You can use the thing of, all oh, they're tracking them, everything. But he basically is like, oh... I think that he made sure that his daughter got off the Death Star 
And because I, I think that in Empire Strikes Back, when he's captured her again, he didn't immediately kill her. He was like, I'm taking her with me. Well, he clearly had something in him. That's, yeah, there's some weird stuff going on. Okay, so Google says, according to Reddit.com, Vader was hunting down the pilot who blew up the Death Star and hired Boba Fett to find them. Boba was unable to, to, Boba was unable to, but he did give Vader a name, Skywalker. This combined with his knowing Luke was force sensitive and had been trained by Obi-Wan was what made him realize the truth. Skywalker? Now, where did Boba tell him Skywalker was the person? I don't know. But even still, like, but, but Skywalker's like, that's, that doesn't mean anything. That's Anakin's last name. <laughs> that would mean a lot to Darth. So is he going, okay, so you're saying that, and that's another big plot hole to me, <laughs> is because we're going to hide this kid, but we're going to give him to much an uncle. Like the, much like the meter wide hole in the Death Star that can blow the whole thing up. Plot hole. A literal plot hole. Wait a minute. So wait, Anakin. Where did <clears throat> okay? So now that's all for Reddit. Now where he got that information? This person. I don't know if that's something from the legacy books. The I think they should have told the uncle Owen. Don't name this. Don't give this kid the last name. It should have been pretty obvious. Name him Luke Starkiller. Something like that. Which it was his original name. Good. Good. Good Thank callback. You. Good Appreciate callback. that. I, I recognize your your research on that. Um, but yeah. Anyways, I have other I have other theories that are half baked. And if you have half baked theories, please send them in to boardgamesnob. Half gmail. baked should be the name of your podcast by Jerry Baker. Uh, well, I could, but it's also Dave Chappelle show. Oh darn! Uh, yeah, did you do it? Yeah, he did. <laughs> that Dave Chappelle's always one step ahead. Show of me. it's just a movie. Yeah, it's a movie. I said show you movie. Can, you can rename Is there a stuff difference? all the time. Half baked. I mean, there's you can have more than one. There's a thousand podcasts called blah, blah, blah. Are they? I, I mean, pick a name. I just don't want it to be something that I end up getting a cease and desist from the producer of Half Baked, the 1998 comedy. Is it 98? Yeah, let's see. Um, I just guessed that. 1998. Wow. Wow. And you're my witness. I'm really sitting here and I just else. threw that out there. And it's I'm got the guy, shocked. that brewer guy that always says, uh -huh. everybody. Oh, yeah. Why? Is Jim. Jim. I hate Jim Brewer. No, he's, he's, I, I yeah. I, he's I, very annoying. He's not funny and he just does. Everybody. I, I'm the guy. Although I did like the yeah. absolutely ridiculous goat boy. Yeah. On that's that's it. But, he, that's but, it. But that's about it. Anyways, so yes, send your other theories. We have other emails. Read that we other email. We had another email from Colton Riddle, who was on the uh, Colleen Farrell episode. That's a good callback. Let's see. What did Colton say? He said, <clears throat> I think he's just referring to the chat itself. He said, hey, great to talk to you the other day. Really bummed the time was so short, but still great. Ryan asked if this might become an annual tradition. I certainly hope so. Though the thought of speaking with you again brings an amount of enthusiasm and excitement that makes me question if I might just be a little obsessed. Could be. But I'll just shrug that off and live in denial. Ha ha ha. <laughs> if we turn up missing, check Colton Riddle's basement. That's a good. Calling and talking to you felt similar to how I've always felt listening to your podcast. <clears throat> now, remi remind me, Colton, he's the dinosaur guy, right? No, that's Mason. Mason no. Pierce. No, Colton's the dinosaur guy. Is he? During the talk, during the, the call-in. He talked about dinosaurs. Mason didn't get to call in. Mason didn't get to call in this time, but last time he talked about like the orbiting of the stars or something. He had some map. Anyway, you're probably correct. Mason continues, it felt like hanging out with a couple Colton. of... Correct. Thank you. Colton says, it felt like hanging out with a couple of good friends. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool? That's it. Pretty cool. Okay. Highlight of your life. And did I mention how short the time was? God dang, couldn't even finish talking about dinosaurs and such. You are uh, correct. I won't prattle on much longer, but hey, if Jerry was serious about having me on, sign me up. Y'all are the best, Colton Riddle. We need to have him on. I can't remember why I said we need to have him on. I need to listen, re -listen to the episode. Why did he talk about dinosaurs? I don't know. I forget. I just remember being very enthused about the dinosaurs for some reason or another. I remember talking to Jerry Wong, and he was talking need, about game the, uh, design. Game design we need to have Jerry stuff. Wong on. He was very interesting. We need, Jerry Wong sent us an email, boardgamesums at gmail.com. Oh, 
Oh, I didn't see, I didn't see that one. No, no, no. I told him to send this one. Oh, right okay. now. He needs to send this one. Another email that I'd like to read. Now, this is a t- we've gotten quality emails here lately. This from Tucker M. Tucker M. He sent this in December. This was after oh, okay. your uh, comment about the show. He says, hello, snobs. I went from getting to end the past couple of months. My friends told me about the show and I've been enjoying it at work when exercising and when exercising. I say had been as the past 20 episodes or maybe more have been less enjoyable. The mega game recaps were great. Jerry and Rick had together uh, were also very enjoyable. But as you clearly figured out, Jerry and Gobby together quite uh, together, quite hard to sit through. I was waiting to email till I caught up, expecting to tell you guys that this show was by far one of my favorites. Slowly, I just wanted to catch up to let you know how much it changed and not necessarily in a good way. Ouch. Ouch. However, it seems that the most recent episode, since writing this email, you guys figured it out. Very happy that you did the right thing and, and humble and humble thing. He's probably talking about me. We are very humble. And communicated your feelings to each other. Hopefully the podcast and more importantly, your friendship will be better at it. Anyways, thoroughly enjoyed what you have. Brought to the board game podcast verse, Bubba Rike Shard, not spelling a mic, boring mic. Ben and Richard, uh, favorite episodes, five of you at BGG, the old Star Wars RPG playthrough, and any Bubba episode. Also, the Emperor Palpatine British impersonation is both me and my buddy's favorite. <laughs> I, I don't remember that Dude, one. That is one of my favorite moments on our own podcast. What happened on that one? I'm blanking on it. Uh, ultimately, we ended up again talking about anxiety, depression type things later on the episode. But we started, you started off doing a Emperor Palpatine a lot. Ah, nah, nah. But then somehow we made him like Australian, I think. We need to find the episode because I don't remember this. Uh, oh, another. You found your sister. All right. Bring, we're, then we were talking about <laughs> how Star Wars would be so different if it was Australian or something. Yes, sister. <laughs> yeah. She was eaten by Dingo. It was. I remember that episode because, like, we were we were vibing, Correct. we were vibing, and then we talked about feelings. Here's the thing, in regards to his particular email, he says, "I feel I often wonder. You know how they talk about your greatest strength is your greatest weakness as I've well. Never heard that. I'm sorry. I've literally never heard that. But I'm I'm open to the thought." I've literally never heard your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. That is a contradiction really? in terms to me. But I want to wow. hear you explain it. So how could it, you be too beautiful? <laughs> I don't understand. Okay, go ahead. Because then it's also like what lures people to you of un Savory. unsavory means. Gotcha. And I love savoring, <clears throat> savoring things. Your greatest strength is You're funny. You're funny. But that's also a weakness. But then nobody can ever take you seriously. Okay. I'm with you on this. I'll, so, I will take this contradiction. Uh, I was thinking in regards to our uh, him talking about us in the site. Where I, we often discuss feelings, emotions, mental issues, etc. Things we're probably not qualified to talk about. <laughs> Anyways. And that's what people enjoy. Is it? That's what people enjoy about our specific podcast because we discuss uh, we're meta for you know you always say oh yeah let's go meta we go meta a lot Mm -hmm. unfortunately we discuss our own selves we talk about ourselves quite a bit yes and people enjoy that because they like they we we receive many comments many emails many uh, discord chats of they can get board game talk anywhere Mm mm-hmm it's the the in it's the dynamic between us that they, makes us unique. They can't get that emotional codependence anywhere else, right? Right. So, but it is also our great, great greatest greatest weakness in that we are the podcast that maybe discusses feelings. Maybe we do it too much. I don't know. Maybe people I, don't. Sir, you're going to have people that like it. You're going to have people that hate it. I think you're wrong about. That point right there. Not that it's the people, us being met or talking about it. It's, I think that's fine. I think what people didn't like is the fact that it, I say we, I mean, technically it was we, but more than likely me, me, was affecting our dynamic. Right, right. Let me recalibrate that statement. By saying weakness, I had this in mind, then I lost it, but now you help me find it again. By us discussing, by us being open with our feelings. Yes. 
we were yelling a lot more at each other. <laughs> well, that was actually pretty great. It's, no, but no, people didn't like it. Okay, well, we some, had a, I'm sure somebody did. We had a few people inside that, yeah, we, they noticed us yelling a lot more Got at each other. Got a little other. hostile, maybe. You're, you were constantly hollering at me about interrupting you. I was constantly losing my patience with you and saying, you don't love and respect me. Which <laughs> made, just, I know. <laughs> just Things of that nature. We're a weird show. What a weird show. <laughs> Let's you imagine some poor and fool, most other some poor, somebody that was their first episode. They <laughs> they tuned in. I'm gonna find out about this game. <laughs> I want to hear about viticulture. Why don't you love me? <laughs> it's just two middle aged men yelling at each other. <laughs> well, you don't respect me. I mean, it's a weird thing, and it it's works. A weird. Why um, change? <laughs> and then then our dear Enrique, who's not here, he's like the Ooh. middle man that maintains an even keeled head throughout. He's pretty useless. He's, you know, <clears throat> I've said this previously on this show. Uh, when I first met Enrique, uh, and well, not when I first met him, I'm, I've known him since he was a small child because I've known the family for years. But him coming into the gaming and the show and the podcast, the fold, the fold. Uh, I, uh, my first initial reaction to Enrique were, I don't. Who is this kid? I don't know him. I don't think I like him. Here's the thing about Enrique. I I love Enrique, and he's one of these people well, that will well, grow uh, on you. Well, hold on. No, you're gonna stop over what I was gonna say. I know I was cutting you off. I so it seemed like you hated. No, I no. see <laughs> so you're gonna make me sound bad. Yeah, I know. I was after you there. No, what, you I, caught what, me when I first got met, met Enrique. I was not too keen on Enrique. He doesn't. He's just. A, he was a 17 year old boy. He eats his fingernails. That eats nothing but chinger, uh, chicken fingers and chicken nuggets and fingers and his own fingers. He eats his fingernails. And, uh, you know, he was at that time. But he has matured somewhat. S- still eats his fingernails. <laughs> still eats his fingernails. He's matured somewhat. Doesn't have a driver's license. <laughs> he still loses the parents. And he plays off the video. But that's not, okay, neither here nor there. But you could still love him for who he is. I have come to appreciate the qualities that Enrique has tremendously. Yes, Enrique's top five qualities. Go uh, now. Patience. He is very patient. He, he never he gets will angry. Sit still in a spot forever. And he number two. Yeah, he never gets angry. I've I have never, never seen, seen him, him upset. upset. I can. <clears throat> I cannot goad Enrique into anger. You will not. No. You cannot. I know. Which is your specialty. I can't. I have tried. I have. I have literally thought there has to be something. There's got to be a dynamic here. And no, you cannot get him irritated. He's there. And just, he has, when we've had previous discussions on this very podcast and even off air, he has had surprising insight yes. into our dynamic that I look at him and I'm like, you live with your parents, you don't have a license, you play nothing but video games. And that's all just very judgmental commentary in my brain. Correct. But yet he also can look at me and say, you are this, 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 and this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, touche, touche. Yeah, he threw it out there, didn't you? Yeah, he did. He knows where to cut you. He's got it. He's got it. That's why we like Enrique. I love Enrique. Even though he is useless. <laughs> but there's some things for which he is incredibly useful for. And board gaming happens to be one of them, which is why we love him. And, and his that's another irritating thing is his board gaming skills have improved. Yes. They, and he's beating me on a regular basis. It, it's shocking <laughs> to have somebody who who is... You don't think that they are thinking about something that they're not planning and strategizing. And, and But there are some games that literally he's a savant at. Like, he figures it out. If it's a card comboing thing, I will naturally be looking, reading the rules on the game and thinking, oh, Ricky's going to kill me on this. Mm-hmm. I am afraid to play that 3,000 Scoundrels game with him. That the Western game that we played that I got yeah. from the bearded, bearded, great <laughs> Geared, bearded, 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 bearded. Yeah, he, he will destroy yeah, you. I'm afraid to play it. I don't want to play it with him because then he'll be obsessed He's, with it. He, uh, another quality of his that his greatest strength is his greatest weakness when he uh, his kidney. looks at a card. He reads everything. He reads all the details. The flavor text. And understands it, knows how it works, knows the ins and outs of the card. Meanwhile, we're sitting here. Ready to go on. Let's move on from this one card, Enrique. He takes up a lot of time he reading was, reading when, stuff. When he was but a mere teenager and we were playing Cosmic Encounter all the time, he asked to borrow the box because I had all the expansions. And he read the cards and the details of 150 plus aliens, all the aliens in Cosmic Encounter. 
He told me he read those cards and that he had retained some of the knowledge on said cards. And I challenged him by randomly pulling out aliens from Cosmic and just saying the name and say, give me a brief synopsis of what their power might be. And he could recall it. Not perfectly, but he had a pretty good idea what that alien did, which was rather shocking to me and somewhat disturbing that somebody would have that type. Anyways, that's Enrique Foy. So uh, in in connection with Caleb's or Tucker's or whoever this email was, uh, (laughs) I don't know. I think that anyways, whatever his name is, doesn't matter. Conrad. His email regarding the show. Go, go. I certainly do appreciate his email regarding this because, yes, I feel like he's correct. The last several tens of episodes had fallen off because of just emotional yeah. everything. It, not only am I going through a difficult time, but Gobby's going through a difficult time. Bubba's going, everybody's going through a difficult time. That's a, and it came out because this, this show is not scripted and we don't really <laughs> sit down and go, you're going to do a British. Palpatine. We sit down and just start talking. That's the, that's our greatest strength. And it's that's our, our greatest, greatest weakness. weakness. Sometimes it could use some direction, mm-hmm. but due to that, We'd sometimes get into just how we feel about things. I acknowledge that, like we said, we were there for a while. I was, uh, I, I wasn't enjoying it. I would, when I was editing, I would be angry at you while I was editing. Well, that's good. And I was like, "Tell me, isn't Jerry just you no know, telling me to be quiet? Don't you interrupt should, him. Blah, should, blah blah blah. You should listen to me more. So, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> so, and Tucker, uh, we hope that you. From that point on, of when we acknowledge that, since an uptick in uh, our uh, positivity towards each other, our enjoyment of the games, our uh, just lighthearted banter, uh, I did cry in an episode uh, about uh, two episodes ago. But cry in every episode. I know. I try not to. I'm, I'm, I'm an emotionally broken man. I'm not. Well, listen, you're talking about being emotionally broken. I think it's important to point out that sometimes your your emotions are a little bit more on your sleeves than I am not. I tend to not say anything or do something. You know, I don't I don't I don't come in talking about stuff a lot. Right. That makes sense. And so I think that that bleeds over. And that's I told you when I walked in here, we didn't plan to shoot this podcast. I literally stopped by Chick-fil-A, which is close to your home, and then stopped by your house to eat said Chick-fil-A because I don't eat fast food in the car. I hate eating fast food and driving. I like My father-in-law says I want to eat like a human. I do. I, I do. want to sit at a table. And it's not safe for me because I enjoy eating sometimes and when i'm driving and enjoying i'm not paying attention mm-hmm. so i just go across the street to chick-fil-a I come back to gobby's house i sit at his table and eat and then i said let's let's drink the rest of this box of wine and shoot this podcast so the point being is that we don't plan this but sometimes when i walk in to shoot podcasts things have happened that i have not dealt with and previously the, the epiphany that i mentioned when i walked in that i had today was was that was that i don't deal emotionally with things and instead of going I don't want to deal with this right now and I'll be okay. Then I get here and we'll have a podcast and now we can't jive because I'm thinking about something else. Right. And then one little thing will set me off because I'm mad or I'm, I'm irritated or something. And I will not say it out loud. Whereas you're a little bit more talking about it, it being obvious and bringing it up where I'll just swallow it down and be like, I'm just going to sit here and see. I appreciate you saying that because sometimes I feel like, Basically, I feel like you have yourself very together and I'm the mess. Oh, no, no. I just don't say anything. <laughs> OK, I'll give you a good, I'll give you a prime example. I'll give you a prime example. Hold on. Uh, let me squeeze out some more of this bladder well, you, of wine. You squeeze out more of that bladder of wine. So. Oh, some ASMR. Enjoy that. Some good crinkling sounds right there. Yeah, you ASMR guys really need to get your life together. You need to check it out. It I, might soothe your soul. I've tried it. It doesn't does, does nothing for me. It's only in my right ear. It doesn't work. The left ear, it, I, I might as well be deaf. I my would, right ear. I would like to look it up exactly <laughs> why, what, what it is. I'm sure it, it has something to do. It produces an actual tingle. I know. I'm sure it has something to do with the frequency. Oh, yeah. Uh, but in, either ahead. ways, my point is, is I, I work in hospice, and I have so here a lot more lately. And uh, there was a particular patient that I was dealing with that happened over, I guess, Christmas, New Year's, that that time period. And this is a typical thing that while I'm, you know, taking care of somebody, you know, when you're working in a business that evolves around death and dying and family and emotions, you yourself have to be somewhat bought into that. But also you have to be guarded like you're not going to be too emotionally invested in everything because you're not just dealing with one patient. You're dealing with several. 
So it's not that you're cold. You're just pragmatic. And and I'm, I'm making all these excuses as I, as I say this to try to explain it. But either way, just imagine working in an industry that is result, that revolves around people dying and you're trying to make them comfortable and then comfort the family. So it's an emotional roller coaster. So 20 something years I've been involved in the healthcare industry. I've been a paramedic, I've been a fireman, I've been in the emergency room and all that mess. I have seen death and dying and all these different things numerous times. And I have never, quote unquote, lost it. I have been panicked when I was new and irritated or scared or thinking I was about to die. Or I've been to many things, but I have never got to the point to where I was so emotionally overwhelmed by something that it just I was unable to control myself. So 20 plus years of doing this, that has never really happened to me. So here, taking care of this one individual who's who's very much about to die and his wife who is taking care of him. And apparently they have no family. They have no children. They're older and they don't have anybody around them. And she is very much wanting to be the sole caregiver. And she does not have the capacity to do so. She doesn't have the ability to do so. And so here I am trying to be as helpful and as as into their life as I can without invading and 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 feel like I'm overstepping. Anyways, long story short, this was quite a long drawn out and emotional thing because as I was again doing what I normally do, planning and understanding this person is going to pass away probably here this time this week whatever. And when it took place, I was not ready for the reaction of 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 his spouse who turned to me and was very, I I did not realize at the time what I was doing, that basically I was being her only emotional support throughout all this. So to me, I'm doing my job. But to her, I am this person that is helping her through this terrible time. And I'm just doing this thing and not realizing that I am super invested in this. Like I'm with this person through this. And so the time finally comes, the individual passes away, and I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this with them and her and, and taking care of it, making arrangements. And I'm done. My job is done. This is when I bow out. This is when the person has passed away. Everything's taken care of, the arrangements for the funeral plan and, and all this. And I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm just the guy slipping out. I'm, I'm the clinical person. And she decides to just basically come up to me and say, can I hug you? And I, as now, if Gabby knows, I, I I don't hug. I'm not. A, I'm not a unless I'm. I hug people in terms of a, a maybe for comedic value. You're not a real in that uh, human touch. Yes, I'm not. A, I'm. I do it for like I, like I'll come up and hug somebody to be like, oh, first man, I'm gonna kind of break the ice, but that's it. I don't do an emotionally charged type thing. And this little lady basically hugs me and tells me, "You don't know what you mean to me," mm-hmm. and that killed me because I realized that. I had fooled myself into believing that I was not. You were um, keeping it professional. Yes. I had not been emotionally invested in taking care, that I was taking care of this person and her and her husband. But yet I, I was. And it was this thing of realizing, oh, this was this was the opportunity that I got to essentially take care of my dad, hmm. who I didn't get to, who was on hospice prior to my being in hospice and had all this other issues. But this guy's history was very similar to my dad. He was a Vietnam veteran and he'd been, he was this. And so it's like he, it was a, it was a weird substitution that here I am acting out how I would have handled things and treat these people as if they were my parents. And I did not realize I had become emotionally connected to them in this way. And is there a way to realize that? You don't, I don't think I, there I, is. In the moment, I don't think that you can. I don't think you can. But after the fact, when it happens, it hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. And so essentially, over the past couple of weeks, I've got to mourn my father's death via vicariously through this other individual that up until a couple months ago, I didn't even know existed. And it was because of this release of, oh, I, I somehow deep down felt guilty that I didn't spend enough time with him or wasn't there during this period, not because of my own choice, but just because circumstances. But here I go acting this out of like, if this was my parents, this is what I would have done. Mm-hmm. Because I, looking back, I did way more. I was, I was, I was there calling and checking and doing things for them overboard. 
than I normally would with just a normal nine to five patient. Oh, I'm not on call. I'm at their house Christmas morning, making sure he has his medicine lined out. I'm calling her at night, making sure (laughs) it's this thing of like, I didn't realize what I was doing. That's what that's for one. I hate that for, I don't know if I hate that for you. No, no, it's a great thing. It's It's a a good thing. thing. Okay. So I'm glad you have some catharsis with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and this is the weird thing, not to dilute this down to something that it is, but you're basically in a super glorified customer service spot. Right. And that's my issue as well on a much and way, way lighter version. Mm-hmm. There's no death involved where I'm doing right. it. But it's like when I get a customer, I, f- I get, it's hard to separate. And this is what my bosses always say. Like, oh, it's just, it's no big deal. They, they don't know you. You don't know them. Just deal with it and move on. I'm right. like, but if I get somebody that sounds nice, they sound kind, they sound frustrated. They don't understand what's going on. I get in. I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm literally trying to help you. Right. That's my job. Yes. You're in this claim spot where we, we actually make more money if I deny you. But at the same time, I'm trying to help you mm-hmm. work your way through what this is. And that's the frustrating spot for me. I can't imagine my mentality, my brain, my emotional state, obviously, because I couldn't handle it. So that's therefore I I would never be in that field. But you're like in the ultimate customer service spot. It is. So it's like you're trying to help these people, but yet keep it professional. You're there to make comfortable. You're there to make money for the company. The company makes money off of it. Right. And that's what that's what's. So weird it is, is that this is really to make money. It, well, it, it is providing it's it's the same thing within. You can boil that down to any type of medical care. It's like, you know, this person's doing something to save their life, but also they're making money. It's like all these heart surgeons and all this. But at the, at the same time, what it is, is is the dichotomy of this is my job and I'm going here. But my job is to also comfort you the family somehow to make sure that you feel like everything is being done right and you're doing good and we're here to help you. That's how you can't train that. That's something that you have to go and realize, oh, I need to say these things to these people. And we need to have a long conversation about, you know, grandma might need a DNR because she doesn't want all these things. So we need to have this conversation. We need you to sign this DNR. Well, no, because because they and they don't want to sign a DNR. Well, why don't you want to sign a DNR? Well, I don't know. I feel bad. And you have to explain all this and say it's not your fault. You're not you're not signing a death warrant. This mm-hmm. is something that you're signing to say you're, we're, she doesn't want to be have CPR and all this life support. And you're not killing her and you're not denying her. You're, you're just you're just making sure that this is her wishes are done. And yes, you can. Some people feel guilty signing these things. I understand it completely. But. Would you feel worse if if this individual if was, they suffered if they suffered, and that helps you 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 have to help people get through that, and I'm I I'm not going to brag or anything, but I'm very good at giving the talks. I have like five different speeches I give people regarding various end of life stuff, that is all about preparing them to be able to be ready to deal with this, and I I'm not so convoluted to think that it that this is going to have you ready a hundred percent of the time because you're never a hundred percent ready. Mm-hmm. But it gets you to the point to where you can make some sound decisions for your loved one and halfway be ready for what's about to happen and also feel confident in knowing that there's this little weird guy that I can call on the phone in the middle of the night and say, hey, I have a problem. I don't know what's going on. Okay. And talk to me. And if you need me to come out there, I'll come out there and I'll take care of it for you. It, it's that. And yes, that is a customer service thing. And I can do that without getting connected, which I have many times. I, I I have. I would feel like in your field, you would almost have to have that type of. I mean, there's so much. Literally, your job is death. Right. So you can't get connected to everyone, or else you would just well, be a wreck. It's not death. It's I, I. I always tell people, I yes, that that is the primary thing. These terminal diseases that are leading to someone's death, but it is, it's comfort. It's these people knowing what's about to happen. They want to be home with their loved ones, and we're just here to make sure they have everything they need to be at home, to not be in pain, and to enjoy what time they have left. Yeah. And so my mindset is that. And so because of that, I'm not so uh, – I, I get connected with these people. Like, yes, I, I go and talk to them, and I hear about their lives. and But at the same time, I'm very 
from the time that I get there, I know what the outcome is going to be. At some point in time, you're going to pass. This person is going to pass away, and I'm going to have to come here and take care of that. And I'm going to have to be in your home, probably most of the time in the middle of the night with your family, who are going to be distraught, or maybe they're not. Maybe they're ready for it, and they're talking about it. whatever it might be. I need to be ready for that and be there and be whatever they need to be. So, and, uh, in in most scenarios, like you're talking about in this situation, hopefully. They have family. There's someone mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. We're like in our the case of my mom. She was in hospice. Uh, the hospice person was just like basically in the corner in the shadows. Right. That's the family was dealing with it. We dealt with mm-hmm. all this stuff, and the hospice person just dealt with. Okay, they need this. Okay, let me give them this for pain. Oh, they mm-hmm. need this. Let me give them this for that. It's more more of a uh, uh what's the uh, more in a medical way. Yeah, yeah, clinic. Not in a emotional way, mm-hmm. which you have found yourself in this episode. So in this dealing with this issue, this particular patient, and you said you realized it helped you or brought back to mind your father. Mm-hmm. So it's like a, a proxy for his death. Right. You found it beneficial. Yes. And I think the reason this happened is that I realized they had nobody. They literally, they had, they had one child that passed away many years ago. They had no family in the area. There was no friends. There was no, they didn't go to any church around there. They didn't have no extended. There was nothing. It was literally, they moved from another area to here and this is going on. So they have nothing. They have nobody. It was the point of. And I'm thinking far ahead out is like, if this guy passes away in the middle of the night, am I going to leave this little old lady here in her home? Like, literally, we're going to come take the body out of the house and then say, like, all right, go to bed. What am I going to do about this? Hmm. Like, I am I am plotting ahead of time of we need to find you a place to stay or someone to come out here and stay with you, that type thing. And it was because when as soon as I realized that she had nothing, there her nobody that was going to be her support system. I flipped a switch and went from being, okay, I'm not I'm not just the person here that's getting paid to be here and being professional. No, I'm also your support system. Like I'm I'm the person that you can call and ask about things and I I'm going to be here for you. And I think that's what changed it and I did that I don't remember consciously making that decision, but at some point in time during this ordeal I did and had dealt with it for several months not realizing that essentially what had happened is I am reliving the traumatic experience of my dad's death over the past two months without me knowing it, without me saying, with me going, man, I'm irritated and tired and upset about everything and why it's causing, I don't know. I don't know why I'm upset. On top of your own yeah, I'm just doing health issues. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not worried about it. And then everything. when this happened, I realized, oh shoot, this is what's going on. Like I'm, I, I've relived this traumatic thing, and because I'm an idiot and not emotionally, I hate the the so emotional did intelligence. Did you come thing. to this upon yourself? Yes, I did, and I immediately called Bubba and said, "Does this sound right?" And told it to him. He's like, "Yeah, why didn't you?" T-? I had never spoke to Bubba about any of this, and he's like, "How did you not know this?" See, this I'm is like, an I, area I didn't, of like, I didn't, I didn't know it. I've, told, I've mentioned previously, it's like, I don't, me, when I feel a feeling in my brain, I never say, why am I feeling this feeling? Well, I mean, besides the obvious, I don't think most people would go that deep into your past of emotional state. Well, it's like when you. I you, think you need help if you're not that type of thinker. Like me, like I, I don't think that way, but you have helped me to say, oh, the reason you feel this and this and this is because of this and this and this. I don't think most people are that aware as you and Bubba. I don't know. I think I think people are if they and I think what this boils down to is when people have a feeling and they're used to their feelings being validated. Or, or maybe they're the type of person that just doesn't need that. They, they just they can naturally go. I feel this way. I feel angry. That they're they can intuitively go. Well, why am I angry right now? Why is it that I'm yelling at the person at this drive-through? I, I do that all the time. Anytime I get upset about something, like I know why I get upset when you interrupt me. Like as soon as you pointed that out, that I was bringing that up, I thought, why in the world? Oh yeah, I know why that is. And it, it was not hard for me to realize why I get so upset about that. And then they go, well, that's not, that shouldn't be. That's not the connection. This is a deep-seated thing that I have. I need to let that go. And it will, and, and I, did I tell you that? No. Okay. My dad's the drill sergeant, right? 
Mm-hmm. The, and he made it very clear to me growing up, the absolute worst thing you, you could possibly do is interrupt him. And matter of fact, instilled in me the idea if somebody interrupts you, they are they are by default disrespecting you. <laughs> no, he never said that. And my mother interrupts absolutely everybody. She's the type of person that will. I'm your mom. She will insert everything, and you know how. And yes, and she. So dealing with my mom, who's and mentally how you feel ill. About your mom? Yes, who's poor. Yeah, you know, she's mentally ill, and we'll interrupt you. We'll look. We'll literally look at you, and you'll say, "You'll." You could say, "Hey," and then she will immediately say a sentence that she thinks you're about to say. That's so it's not just interrupting you. If I said, Hey mom, she'll be like, Yes, we're going today. <laughs> like literally that. Like, like you're like, what do you what do you mean? Like she's that mm. level. It's not just interrupting you. It is she's trying to anticipate what you're about to say. Will drive you crazy. Anyways, it realized so that that was an easy thing for me to go, oh yeah, this is a thing that I have. You don't interrupt me. We're on a podcast. I'm saying something. God was always interrupting me. And at some point in time, that clicked. And I'm dealing with my mom more. And I'm like, it was a constant. She's always interrupting me. And now I get on the podcast and you're always interrupting me. And it just molded. I never interrupt you. Hey, either way. The point being is that I think that people who who come to these feelings and realize what causes them, you're healthier for it because you can now feel like, oh, this is why I do this thing. Yeah. And if I want to stop doing it, then I can I can correct this. Like saying things out loud. That's why what the whole the, the talk therapy that they call it, where people just go to a counselor and talk. There's this theory of that that just hearing truth is what heals people. Like saying things out loud that that you might feel but you don't know to be true. Saying it out loud and just hearing the truth out loud of like, yeah, this is why I feel this way. And having somebody who's sitting there that's a counselor going, yeah, it's probably why you feel that way. That affirmation is enough for someone to go, yeah, that fixes the problem. Like this is this makes me feel better about it and be able to deal with it. And so I think that being able to have your your emotions and know, OK, this is probably why this is happening. That alone. This is why I'm angry when I drive and somebody cuts me off. OK, well, doesn't mean that you're going to try to fix it. It just, you feel better knowing that this is why you do that thing. So how do you, how do you deal with the mindset of basically, I understand everything you're saying. And basically the old, I would say boomer mindset of toughen up, pick Mm. yourself up by your bootstraps. Life sucks. Move on. Well, so yes, life does suck. And that picking yourself up by the bootstraps is impossible. That's just to say. But but my point with the get around that mindset is. Because you have people that are like, you need to deal with your feelings. Then you have people who are like, you know what? You're dealing with, oh, my mommy and daddy were mean to me. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, my mommy and daddy have passed away. Deal with it. Suck it up. Life sucks. Deal with it. There are several ways which I have found personally, and I'm not a psychologist by any means. And I've heard other people discuss this as well. But the two things that have helped me is, number one, I typically change for other people. Like if I know that me doing a thing upsets somebody, I, I, I go, OK, I'm going to change for this person for the best because this upsets this person or it does this thing for them. And I have it within me to go, you know what? You're right. I can stop doing that. I'm going to make that effort. And so. When I see things in myself that I want changed or things that have happened in the past that are bad, I don't go, well, this other person had it worse than I do. And thus, I shouldn't complain about it. That That's a, that's really you're not being tough when you do that. What you're doing is it's it's a weakness because change is 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 not wanting to address it is weakness. Just going suck it up is weakness. Addressing it takes bravery. Addressing it is the emotional work. So really, it's this pseudo mindset of I'm just going to swallow this down and not deal with it. When really dealing with it is harder than just swallowing it down. That, mm-hmm. That's the easy thing is to ignore you're it. You're ignoring it. Yeah. yeah, you're ignoring it. That's that's basically what you're saying is let's just ignore this and we'll just let the effects happen. And when you realize that ignoring things, factors into your relationship with other people or just how you act, then you're more motivated to go, man, I am, I'm very impatient and this affects every part of my life. And I see why this, this is a negative. What makes me do that? Okay. All right. 
And then at some point in time, you hit on one of these things that is, oh, man, this is this is what you experienced. This is the bad thing that took place in your life that that made you be this way or you allowed. Really, I'll use the term allowed to be this way. And it's very easy to go, well, other people have it worse, so I shouldn't worry about it. When, when all you're saying is, I just don't want to deal with it. That's, that's, that's what that means. And I think it's interesting. You can see that generationally and how each generation decides to deal with stuff and what's acceptable. Like after World War II, it was the, that tough guy mentality. Mm-hmm. And not because it was a tough, they were literally like everyone that was in, anyone who fought in World War II or any of that generation, they were freaking messed up in the brain. Oh, yeah. They saw and dealt just uh, anytime I watch a documentary about World War II, I'm like, no wonder there was a whole generation of messed up men. Mm -hmm. So then they take that on to their children, Mm -hmm. which would be the boomer generation. Mm -hmm. That generation is the suck it up generation. Mm -hmm. Deal with your feelings. Then you have Generation X, so to speak. Generation X is me and your generation of like a very confusing like. This is how we were raised, but we don't feel this way. Mm-hmm. Then you get into the millennials, and then the Gen X were like, oh, we're dealing with feelings and stuff. And we, the, the, the boomers and the Gen X view them as weaker for that reason. But, but here's the deal, is that that term, deal with your feelings, by definition, I am dealing with my feelings. Right. You're actually not yeah, dealing with your feelings. You're not dealing right. with your feelings. It, it's, it's the... I know I'm pushing myself too much, so I'm going to take a day off or this mental health thing because mm-hmm. I know that if I don't if I don't go home and clean my house and if I just go to work today and I'm gonna come home, my house is gonna be dirty, I'm gonna feel horrible, it's gonna throw me into a depression. So I'm gonna take a day off, I'm gonna clean my house, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do some adult things that I know I need to get done. Mm-hmm. And that's gonna make me feel more motivated and thus it's there there you go. It's it's this I'm not going to let this thing continue on so that I feel depressed. Or the I I look at things in this way and I know that that is wrong. Like I feel like a certain codependence towards somebody or I get angry about certain things. Okay, well, I'm going to look into that. What, what causes that? And so that is dealing with your feelings. And I mean, it all it does is make you not only more productive, but it also makes you just a better person overall, like your ability. And I say better. Uh, every, often when I say better, we think of in terms of good and bad. When I say better, I just mean that you're able to deal with things in a proficient way. You're able to accomplish what you want to do. I think what most people look for in someone, a a good friend, just say, is someone that they can lean upon. And if you cannot get yourself into a mental state emotionally, mentally, where you are able to be leaned upon yourself, Mm -hmm. Then you're not really a good friend. Well, and I have said this before about people who are chronically depressed. And that's not, I mean, that may not be your own issue because of deep seated things. But Mm -hmm. like when I think about a good friend, you want to be, you want someone that you can lean on and then you want to also be able to be leaned on. Right. And that's true with people who are chronically depressed that. When you're depressed, you can't hardly think of anybody else. You're saying it's, it's, you are turned inward. And it's a it's a clinical thing. I mean, it, it's it's a thing that it robs you of the ability to be able to think about other people and to feel good because you don't have that aspect in your life. You're depressed about yourself. You're looking at yourself. You think that you're useless. You think whatever. It's very myopic. Yes. And then when you you're you're actually having a hard time, you you, you lose the ability to be able to go do something nice for somebody else and have that feeling of, hey, I did this good thing because you're too busy thinking about yourself. You're too locked into it. And that's what um, it's a terrible thing. And and you can look at somebody who is depressed and it's very easy to think they're a selfish person person Mm -hmm. when really they just do not have the mental energy to engage in anything else. Like they're just barely dealing with their own stuff. And if they can ever get past that and deal with that, like you help yourself, then you can help somebody else type thing. You just get, and that helping somebody else in terms help you. And it's just a, it's the cycle of, of recovery is you're now doing something worthwhile for somebody else. So to wrap up this episode, this is a great board game. Do you feel, do you feel better? Oh yeah, mentally. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, and it was after this episode. Yes, yes, I felt better, and it, I mean, it was a thing of of realizing that and going like when we had our our, our episode where we kind of come to the conclusion of this is what's going on. This this is you you aired out kind of your grievances that you had. It bothered me because I'm like, what caused me to do this over this period of time? What is going on? Of course, I have my generic answers of various things that came to mind, but it felt, it felt more deep seated. And I think that that what it was it. It was a combination of dealing with this, dealing with my mom, dealing with other things. And I'm like, this is a, this is a thing that's that has wrapped me up mentally and emotionally. And I've just not been able to deal with it. I have to deal with this to be able to move on. And it, yeah, it was a combination of all those things. So, yeah, that was the mental, it, it's having the mental clarity to be able to look at how you're acting and go, what what emotions am I feeling and what is causing this? And sometimes you can't do that by yourself. Sometimes you have to bounce it off somebody well, else. Well, I'm glad you have Bubba because it is not me. Well, Bubba, Bubba, <laughs> Bubba, Bubba, I, Bubba just confirms what I already know. <laughs> Bubba is me calling saying, listen, do you think this might be it or do you think it might be this? And Bubba going, I don't know. Bubba's got his own issues. Yeah, Bubba going, I don't know how you, maybe you need to think about this. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, that's, it's the, I've thought about it. I've come to this conclusion. This, this to me has to be it because this is what's making me feel this way. And, uh, but yeah. Anytime you can reach that conclusion where you realize what that is in you that you can't describe this, that's a good feeling. And that's why, you know, if you have these types of issues, feeling, uh, seek help. Seek professional help, not this podcast. Not this podcast. We should be sponsored by BetterHelp.com. <laughs> we are BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp.com. Everybody else if is. If BetterHelp.com ever listened to our podcast, they would call us up immediately and be like, look, uh, we don't know if we could even sponsor y'all because it's like, y'all. We will give you free care. Free care. Just to work out your issues. Yeah. We're, yeah. All right. Well, uh Again, yeah, we just fired this episode up. We know we need it. We got to have content. We got to put it out there. We need the content. We enjoy talking. We Plus, enjoy podcasting. We had to re read the emails. We had emails to read, and then eventually it developed into a discussion about what we have just been talking about. Uh, Jerry, I'm glad you feel better, hopefully. I do feel better. And, uh, you know, onwards and upwards. You know, that's a phrase that I've learned here lately, but people say, and it's like very positive, it literally means nothing. Onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. That yeah, means you're go you're moving forward. Moving going forward, up. going up. Yeah. I, I mean, I know what it means, but it's just very generic, but it's very positive. Mm -hmm. And lots of people say it, but I may adopt it. Onwards and upwards. That may be my closeout line for every episode now. Onwards Just to make you feel better about yourself. Onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. <laughs> All right. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Board Onwards Game and Snops. up yours. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, 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 thank you for listening uh, and uh, onwards and up yours uh, goodbye Bye. thank you for tolerating this episode of the board game snobs stay classy <laughs>